Take it away, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to my studio. Um, I'm out here in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. You can see some of my projects I've been working on. Um, some of these colors that I'm going to go over, I started using in my newer work, like this one back here. Um, but it's always exciting when uh, you know, a paint company like Windsor Newton puts out some new paints because artists like me, we're waiting for that new color <laughs> to add to our uh, collection and uh, put up in our work. So collectors will be like, how do they do that? Um, but it's because we're the first ones I got the color. Um, I do want to uh, share some of our Instagram handles too. So I'm going to actually flip over so you can see um, this card. And just a little bit about me. I do a lot of uh, teaching full time and then these art demos. And then I work um, part time now as a professional artist. I've been working with Mark Wolf Contemporary uh, representation there since. Uh, 2007 now, and then Elizabeth Houston Gallery in New York City, right over in the Lower East Side. And then I'm also represented by, um, or I started showing work at Modern Eating Gallery as well. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. I love oil paintings, my favorite uh, medium to teach. Uh, so you could see some of the demos I do at the Fine Art Collective North America. So screen capture this if you can, or jot it down. Uh, I'll be doing some demos there with some of my peers. We review a lot of, um, Pro new products that come out or uh, products that have been out by uh, some of the big brands like Windsor Newton, Liquitex. Uh, follow me at Ryan Martin Art. This is all on Instagram, by the way. And um, I have about seven group shows coming up this fall. So on end of summer and fall. So if you want to follow my progress there, um, it's always fun to uh, read people's comments and everything. And then also follow Windsor Newton. Uh, that's the brand I'm going to cover today. So they might cover a little bit more information there and they have a lot of... Um, a news whenever they come out with new colors, that's a good place to follow them. All right, let's get started. So um, this is the new eight colors by Windsor and Newton. And uh, like I said before, I'm always excited whenever a new color comes out because, uh, you know, it gets tiresome after a while if you're using a lot of the same colors and it, it just inspires me again. So I've been using these colors and I did, um, I love painting florals and like fish and portraits as you saw. So the first thing I usually do when I get new colors is kind of do a limited color palette. Um, so I limit myself to only these new colors plus white. And, um, and I'll see kind of how far I could push them. This one, I'm gonna push a little further uh, as well, which I'll show a little later, uh, but we are gonna start from the beginning. And if you're new to oil painting, I'm gonna try to cover as much as I can. So if you're uh, been oil painting for a while, uh, just uh, hopefully uh, don't mind that, <laughs> but hopefully you'll still pick up some great new tips from visiting my studio today. Um, the uh, first thing I'm going to do, if you want to follow along, I'm going to go over a little bit of the materials that you um, might have in the kit. I know if you got your kit, you have smalt and then you have um, the ruby matter alizarin. If you didn't get any of the other colors, hopefully you at least have white around or something because you're gonna want to be able to mix that. If you don't, please just still follow along. You could always try it without white. I'll give you some techniques to use um, that you could do to uh, follow along so you have something to show in the gallery view. But if not, um, white is definitely something you're gonna want to have in your oil painting kit, no matter what colors you have. Uh, you also got the uh, liquid. Um, this is the medium I use a lot. I'll go over that a little more too. And then um, you'll have a brush. I'm gonna be painting mostly with uh, this brush is just the synthetic uh, sable hog, uh, I'm sorry, synthetic hog brush. Uh, it's a number two. Uh, if you went out and bought all the materials, you'll have the four as well. Um, I'll probably use that just for the larger areas. And then um, you should, uh, your, uh, your items might look a little different if you purchased um, the, Plaza list. I'm just using what you know Windsor Newton's given me, so it's uh, very comparable what you're probably going to be painting on if you got the canvas uh, paper pad. So I'm going to start on this first. I wrote out the colors so we could kind of go over them. I always like to check the mass tone of a color when I get it. The mass tone is the color that uh, you see when it's straight out of the tube. So I'm going to start with uh, transparent orange. Now what's unique about orange historically is that it's a very difficult color to get in a single pigment. Um, and 
it used to be collected from like volcanic areas where there's a lot of sulfur, um, very dangerous to mine or get, uh, and it made it very valuable at the same time. Um, uh, colors were also, oranges were made, but they're mixed with two different pigments. And I'll explain the difference and why it's so important that all these new colors are single pigments. Um, but keep that in mind that this is still single pigment. It's something that artists are always kind of looking out for. So I got my transparent orange. I also have uh, some uh, Sansador uh, in my little uh, silicoil jar. So if you see me kind of going off screen to clean my brush and you hear a little uh, ring <laughs> of the, the little uh, ring in there like this, that's just me um, clean off my brush. So I'm gonna get a little bit of the paint and you can follow along here too. It's good to kind of get a feeling of the paint to see how it goes on. And the transparent orange, I'm gonna zoom in a little more. Uh, you can see the mask tone right out of the tube, it's a red orange. And it's, like it says, it's very transparent. Transparent colors are great for glazing. So if you glaze a lot like I do, uh, uh, I think about five of these colors are transparent. Uh, I'm gonna rinse out my brush and I'll show you the next color. The orange uh, lack mineral is another orange. This one is opaque though. So when you, uh, the mass tone is not gonna be as dark. I'm just gonna get a little bit of liquid. I always mix a little bit of the medium uh, in here just so um, it'll spread a little bit easier. You don't have to put as, as much paint as I do. Uh, you could see it's much more opaque. It's not showing through the white as much, but it, it's, uh, I mean, it's not as transparent, but it's very opaque. So people who like a lot of good coverage, this is another uh, single pigment color. Sometimes cadmium oranges could have two different varieties of um, pigment in there. Um, so if you want a single pigment color, the orange lack mineral is the way to go. We also have ruby matter alizarin, which is uh, an alizarin lake color. This one was actually recreated from, we get a lot of notes, uh, Windsor Newton from George Field. Uh, and this is from a color swatch they found that he made in 1937 in his tint book. And they recreated this color Ruby matter alizarin. And you see it's very reminiscent of a, like a alizarin crimson. It's permanence, uh, like it's light fastness. It's not gonna fade as much. It's a really pretty color. Again, this transparent as well. Uh, alizarin crimson is notorious for uh, fading. Uh, they still sell alizarin crimson because the color is, you know, very popular and favorite one. But you might know the more popular one now is uh, alizarin crimson permanent or a permanent alizarin crimson. Um, it's made so that it doesn't um, fade as much. So ruby matter alizarin against the permanence is A, so it's it's going to be permanent. Uh, ultramarine pink is the next color. And it has a uh, like a violet undertone. You'll see it goes out pretty much black. I'm gonna move the camera down in case the captions are covering it. Uh, I'm always excited when I have these transparent colors because you could also get new varieties of black. You could see this one goes, you know, it's black, but it's transparent enough where you're gonna get um, some of those purple undertones that come out of it. So this is another new color. You can see how transparent it is right away. I'm, I'm putting it on kind of thick and it's still a lot more transparent than like the, the other um, transparent colors were. Uh, so this is excellent for glazing too. I could see this going in like if you had a, a medium to light complexion person, you wanted to put in some uh, shadows on or some flowers like we'll do later. Smalt or Dumont's blue um, is another uh, historical color that was brought back. Oop, I got a lot of oil in there. 
I'm just gonna, if that ever happens, um, it's just this one's been settling for a while, you could always close the tube and kind of smush it around, trying to mix the oil up a little. If not, your first big squeeze might be a little bit of the oil. Uh, this one, again, you could see the mass tone's really dark, so it's nearly black. Um, it's a really rich color. This is one of my favorites of the, of the, um, the transparent orange is my by far favorite, but this one I'm liking a lot too. I started using a lot more in my fish paintings that I've been re doing recently. Clean my brush real quick. Uh, oriental blue. And again, if you don't have the whole kit, hopefully you do have a few oil paint tubes at home. You could kind of follow along and grab ones that are similar. So you could follow along today. Um, you, so you might be grabbing some ultramarine or something or Prussian blue if you have it to replace these ones if you're not using them today. Uh, but uh, if you do have a chance to check out uh, some of these colors, I would definitely say the transparent orange and this oriental blue too is if you like really vibrant colors, um, you'll see right away that this blue is a lot more uh, vibrant, a lot more colorful. If you like to do more muted, subdued paintings, this Dumont's blue is probably the one that the smallest is the one you probably want to try. It almost has an iridescent feel, uh, the Dumont's blue too, I forgot to mention. They used to use it in like pottery and stuff. So uh, people liked it because it had uh, that quality. Um, but vibrant, vibrant blue. Mineral green deep is one of those colors that when I first tried it, I was like, meh, you know, I'm not excited about it, but now it's grown on me. Um, I think mostly because I've been doing a lot of aquatic uh, scenes with a lot of greens and I want more subtle greens. And I find myself grabbing uh, these tubes of it. So this is kind of the, the silent hero now for me, it has been this uh, mineral green deep. It's an opaque color. So I don't typically use opaque colors as much because I'm always glazing. Uh, if you're new to oil painting, don't worry, I'll cover a lot of that a little later today. So this one is um, much more opaque, uh, but a very kind of subtle green. And I've been using it a lot kind of in shadows or to kind of knock down some colors when I don't want it so vibrant of a green. Uh, it's good to have kind of contrast in your work. It's all vibrant, it tends to not look so vibrant. You put a vibrant area next to a more dull area, it'll start to uh, kind of ring more, sing more. Warm brown pink is a color I didn't know I was gonna be as excited about as I ended up being, but um, browns, like I don't use a lot of browns in my work. I typically mix them, um, but you risk getting colors kind of muddy. Uh, so it is nice to have, um, yeah. Yeah, this brown, warm brown, pink. And you'll see it has a warmer kind of tone versus like, uh, you know, raw umbers or some of the burnt siennas are a little, like burnt sienna is very kind of sour, more orange. This is much more muted. It's really a convenient color to have on hand. So when you think brown, you kind of think of this. It's also great for, um, I've been doing like a lot of uh, uh, portraiture as well, darker complexion people. I started using this one, it works great in my own skin tone, it could kind of bring out, if you're into portraiture, it's a nice warm pink without getting muddy or warm brown without getting too muddy. Uh, I'm gonna do this real quick, just for a few colors. I have uh, already a spreadsheet out here, or not a spreadsheet, another sheet out with all these tinted. I just wanted to show you though, how white could change the color. Um, so if I get a little bit of my medium and get some of my white, let me double check my time. All right, so um, there's some colors that will change a little bit with the white, you'll notice like transparent orange, really red orange, right? But when you add the white, it's gonna start bringing out more of an orange. So it's suddenly, it's not just a lighter red orange, it brought out what they call the undertone. So now it's like a yellow orange almost. Um, and that's gonna happen to some of your colors. Uh, so it's always good to kind of check them out. I always do like, it's always great to have the canvas uh, paper around so you don't have to, you know, use a whole canvas to kind of test your colors. Um, and I'll create these swatches and kind of play around with them for a while. But here's kind of how they tint out. I also put some alizarin crimson so you can see how it compares 
permanent alizarin crimson, how, how it compares to the new ruby matter alizarin. The uh, alizarin crimson is really vibrant when it's painted in its mass tone or glazed on, uh, where the ruby matter is not as vibrant. But when you tint it, the alizarin crimson gets a lot colder and more dull and gray, where ruby matter alizarin, when you tint it, stays more vibrant and gets a little more pink. Uh, so it's good to kind of try it out. You can see why I love this oriental blue. Um, I'm always in search of like these uh, very <laughs> bright blues or oranges. <laughs> uh, before we get started on our painting, though, I did want to cover real quick uh, what is oil paint? I know a lot of you have been painting probably for a while, but if you're new to oil painting, uh, it's good to know kind of where your uh, paint comes from. Uh, paint is typically a pigment and a vehicle or a, a binder. And in oil paint, your binder is going to be uh, oil. Um, and this is from flax seeds. If you're not sure what flax seeds are, you can see them like at your health stores or grocery market, just these little seeds. And they cold press them into this linseed oil, if they hot press them or refine it in a way, you'll get refined linseed oil. Uh, cold linseed oil will dry a little faster. So that's kind of what you'll put down. You'll mix it um, and you'll use it to kind of extend your paint, but also to make your paint more flexible so it doesn't crack. Um, but uh, today we're using liquid. It's just much more convenient um, for me to demo with. And also if you're getting started, it's it's kind of nice because some people are like, I don't know which medium to buy. So it's good to start maybe with the liquid, or if not, you could start um, playing around with the, the mediums. Uh, along with that, you'll see on the paint tube, uh, it says that not only is there linseed oil, but there's safflower oil. Safflower oil is a lot more thin. I mean, a lot more, um, not only thin, but it's a lot more light. Uh, so it doesn't affect the color as much. If you can imagine if you're using linseed oil, it's gonna alter the pigment color a little bit. Uh, it's gonna make it a little more yellow. Why don't we just use safflower oil all the time? Because it dries so slow. <laughs> it would take you know, a really long time for the oil to dry. Uh, so you'll typically only see safflower oil and mostly uh, like all these have them, but um, the whites might just have all safflower oil. So if you're ever wondering, why does my white take forever to dry? Uh, it's because they're trying to keep it from yellowing so they don't put linseed oil on it. Uh, pigments, if you want to see what the pigment looks like that they mill into the oil, look at how beautiful that color is. This is ultramarine blue, that's the pigment. Uh, so it's just very powdery and they mill it really well. If you've ever made oil paint, and usually if you do art school or something, they have you make a, a batch, it's really difficult to make. <laughs> You'll be really tired kind of milling it out and then it won't be as beautiful as kind of in the tube. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where oil paint comes from. And while I have these colors out, we'll just use them to kind of start sketching out our painting. Now, if you have the kit, it should have this photograph I took. Um, and I took two because in case you're like, ah, that's a little complicated of a composition, just go for one flower, you know? Um, you won't have to, you know, you could always add in the others later if you're like, oh, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling confident. The first thing I wanna do is map out my painting. Now you could do this with a pencil. Uh, I tend to have my students, even when they're beginning oil painters, to practice using their, um, <coughs> excuse me, their brush to uh, kind of sketch it in. To uh, get started though, I do wanna, I give you as many tips as I can, especially if you're an oil painter. I love going to um, even some former students of mine, they're getting their studio practice started. And even though I'm supposed to be like their mentor, they always teach me cool little tips. So I hope I can give you a few tips today. Uh, I always try to think about the first mark you're making as an artist is the size and format. Um, if you've ever uh, framed work, it could get kind of pricey. So if you're gonna be you know, framing or gifting out a lot of art, my tip is always work at a frameable size if possible. So you can get a nice cheap frame somewhere um, and you spend more money on art materials. Now, I'm gonna use just a pencil. I know this is eight by 10. So I'm gonna just outline an eight by 10. So if I love how this painting comes out, I kind of know I could um, easily find a mat and frame for it. So I'm gonna just lightly kind of draw that in or, or dark so you could see it actually. So I'm gonna be working kind of in there, uh, eight by 10. Uh, the 
another thing that you can do is you could get some like artist tape and tape it off if you want a clean edge like if you're just going to pin it up in your studio uh, just make sure you get tape that's uh you know a, a non-sticky sticky tape you know one that's like drafting tape or something won't be ripping up your paper you kind of peel it off to get nice clean edges today though i'm going to do a little different i'm going to i want more of kind of a rough edge and i could always frame it if i want to clean it up all right that's your first mark getting in your um getting in the size and the proportions of your canvas i'm going to start with this one actually this one on the left and i'm going to try to work from the biggest shapes to the smallest shapes when i'm working and to get started um i'm going to map out the painting with very thin layers i'm going to get a little bit of the sansador on my the uh, solvent on my brush and put it on my uh, palette. And then I'm gonna get a little bit of my liquid, my medium. And I wanna just sketch it out with a very subtle color. So maybe I'll add a little white. And then I'm gonna add, um, you could mix with your palette knife too. If you have one, that's a really good studio habit, especially if you're mixing a lot of paint. I'm gonna use my brush just cause I'm gonna be painting fast. And if you're following along, they're gonna, they're recording this. So you could always view it a little later. Um, so don't feel rushed, you know, take your time. I become a fast painter doing a lot of demos. So I'm using the um, smalt blue because it's kind of just a very light, subtle blue. It's not going to be like so powerful as the oriental blue I have there. And I'm just going to start mapping out where I want my petals. The star of the show is this big magnolia flower. Uh, maybe I'll mark off the center a little. So if you could see, it's very uh, you know, thin layer. I'm not committing a lot of oil to it. So back in focus. Um, I'm finding out kind of where the center of the flower is. And if you're not, if you feel like you're not good at drawing, you know, just go with it. The, um, the, my favorite part about art making now is that the last hundred and some years of art making has been about celebrating individuality. We all came out with the same flower, you know, um, I, I could teach students to all draw an apple exactly how the flower or the apple looks, but then we'd have a whole room looking exactly the same with all the same apples. So, um, so I always try to push a little bit more of an individuality when I'm teaching even these demos, just getting kind of the silhouette of um, these petals. If you're new to drawing as well. Uh, you could kind of imagine an ant walking around like a little tiny bug walking around the edge of the painting. Where does it turn? I'm always looking back and forth between my reference and what I'm painting or drawing. I'm making adjustments if I need to. If I don't like something, what's great about oil painting, if you're new to it, you can just wipe it off. You know, it comes off pretty easily. I use these uh, like uh, Viva paper towels or something to leave less lint. Uh, I think that's the brand, but you know, those paper towels that have um, a little bit more like what, what mechanics would you use. You could use rags to some cotton rags or something that'll won't get everywhere. So I'm just sketching in my little petals. It's not looking exactly like my flower, but I'm okay with it. Uh, some of the proportions are a little off, but again, that's what's great about painting botanicals. And part of the reason why I do it is because you can, uh, it's organic, it's an organic form and it's gonna change with the, the, a little gust of wind touches it. <laughs> uh, so it's really forgiving. Now this petal got really small, it's supposed to be a lot bigger uh, and my cropping's a little off, I'm not too worried about it. I'll just make this petal a little smaller. All right, I think I got most petals out. I think this petal I want a little bigger. That's the other petal in the background. All right, so I got, got kind of got my main flower in. I could refine a little more later. Still using very thin layers. Um, you'll hear a lot about fat over lean, fat over lean with oil painting. Um, we're painting a very lean layer. There's a lot of solvent in my brush with the paint. When you add liquid or oil, your mediums and stuff, that's considered fat. And that's considered, uh, the fat is considered a, a flexible layer. You want flexible layers over uh, the more rigid layers. All 
All right, and then now I'm gonna map out the leaf. This part's important, but the next parts I'm gonna probably uh, go a little faster so you could see. All right, just mapping it out. I'm so curious to know how many of you are painting with me right now. Of course, Very, everybody is, right? Everybody, right? Everybody. <laughs> are you painting? <laughs> um, sure. We, we need uh, to get you a little kit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, the thing is, is that, you know, they ship out of Nashville and I'm, I'm in Silver Spring. So um, <laughs> I don't usually get the kits. So I need to start doing that, though. Um, <laughs> Ellen actually has a really good question. Ellen wants to know if you ever cover the canvas with a layer of thin paint before you start the drawing. Uh, oh, that's a really good uh, question. I do paint in a ground first, typically. Uh, a ground is just one solid color. Um, so I will do that. Uh, a lot of times people, yeah, will also paint in a very subtle color. You'll see me doing that a little bit with the background shortly. Um, but for this one, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of just drawing in the outline first. Uh, there's a lot of ways to approach it too. You could paint in uh, one solid color with thinned out a lot and then kind of wipe away the highlights. So you get a lot more like a luminous kind of feel. My painting approach is gonna be more like a la prima, very like, uh, you know, a quick uh, sketch leaving the strokes and stuff like that. So this one's not gonna be as kind of luminous as some other work I do. Uh, but yeah, no, that's great. A uh, ground is helpful sometimes too, so that you can get a lot of the um, mid-tones in. Mid-tones are sometimes hard to find, uh, and then you're not painting on a stark white. All right, so next, I'm gonna switch my brush, and I'm gonna start blocking out, um, oh, oops, I'm sorry, uh, before I switch my brush, I'm gonna actually be uh, painting in the flower. Um, so I'm gonna create some neutral grays, I'm gonna create my grays. I remember, I forgot how I even did the last one, but grays are, you could get by um, painting in the, uh, mixing two colors that are opposites. So if you have a blue, you just add some orange to it and you're gonna get like a neutral gray uh, or a yellow and vice versa. You could get violet and you're gonna get a gray. Well, I have a lot of blues and oranges, so I'm gonna use those. So I got a gray. I just mixed my uh, orange lac mineral with my Dumont's blue and I'm gonna add some white. And I'm gonna start mapping out the shadows that I see in the painting. Now, my, my photograph's a lot more yellow. And if you notice, we don't have yellow in the new set, right? You could always grab some yellow if you want to. I try to challenge myself with new pigments to, or new you know sets they kind of put out of colors um, to see how far I could push it and what I could get away with. Your eye is naturally gonna crave yellow if you have orange, I mean, if you have uh, a lot of the colors in there, like uh, some of these uh, oranges and greens, it's gonna crave something like orange or yellow. So I could just kind of work without it. So I'm gonna get my, this petal's kind of all dark. So I'm gonna map that in with just a dark real quick. We'll go in later with some lights. There's, this part's kind of dark. Again, please don't feel like you have to paint this fast. Maybe just render a, a petal out if you want. Just dropping some color in. Just trying to get the values down. I'm gonna rinse out my brush. And then now I'm gonna paint in the lighter areas. I'm just gonna get some of my white. My white will pick up a little of the blue, which is fine. It's you with typically with painting, the rule is you don't wanna put in the blackest black, the darkest dark, and you don't wanna put in the whitest white. You wanna reserve those for if you have a sun in your painting or a sparkle of the sun or something. Uh, and that just makes it feel a little more realistic. Rarely do you go into a, you know, a room and you see something as bright as the sun. And 
an oil paint, if you're new to oil painting, you'll notice it doesn't dry right away, right? So it's oxidized is the way it kind of dries, it cures, it needs to grab onto an oxygen molecule to cure. Whereas acrylic, it's gonna eva it's gonna dry almost as fast as the water evaporates because it just has to dry through evaporation. So with oil paint, you risk your colors getting a lot more muddy right away. So I'm just gonna paint in some colors and anything I wanted to wipe away, you could always wipe away if you had too much dark underneath. And you're kind of getting a feeling of a flower, but when you zoom up close, it's just like a bunch of little strokes. And we're just gonna focus on putting in the lights in versus the darks. And the subtle value variation is what we're going for. You wanna avoid getting too much darks in if you can, if you wanna make it look a little bit closer to the photo. Again, if you don't wanna make it look like a photo, it's up to you. I'll be happy if I see a big vibrant blue magnolia. <laughs> All right, petals are in. I could render this out more. I just wanna make sure I have enough time to show you some other techniques too. All right, I did the petals. Um, I'm gonna go over one concept real quick because I know I'm gonna be mentioning single pigments a lot and I'm talking about neutralizing colors. So hold that thought or hold that painting thought real quick. And I'm gonna also have uh, answer some questions for you real quick if you need to. Um, so single pigments, what's important about it is let's say I wanted to mix green. I was, let's say I was making a color uh, and I, I wanted to make a neutral color. And I don't know, I found out that I wanted to mix purple and green together. Well, if I didn't have a single pigment, say this is a paint tube, but single pigment, uh, purple, all single pigment, green, all single pigment. What it really looks like is if I had a purple, cause you know, red and blue make purple, it would look not exactly like this, but you would have pigment dots pigment that's all blue in there and you have pigments that's all red. And that's all suspended and it looks to you and our eyes as purple. But then if I was gonna mix my green and it was a two pigment green, I would have lots of yellow and blue in there, right? And if I mix these two together, this color that I feel is green or it is green, but it's made from two pigments. What you're really getting is you're actually mixing four pigments together unknowingly if you're not looking at the pigment. So now you have four pigments all mixed together. And you, what happens is you start getting a little bit of a muddy fill. And if you've been oil painting for a while, you know that look. <laughs> uh, everything just starts to look dead. Uh, sometimes you want that in a painting. Sometimes you want kind of more of a somber, desolate kind of feeling. But if you're not going for that, it's good to know which ones have single pigment and not. For me, I like to work with a lot of vibrancy. So if I had a single pigment green, not one that was made from two pigments, I would just be having two pigments mixed together. And it's going to be a lot less muddy. It's going to look more clean of a neutral color, more, more of a... Um, I don't know, it just won't have kind of that murky look. Uh, so if, if possible, if you're trying to uh, go for that look, single pigments is how you can get there. You could always check the pigments on the back of the tube. It's gonna list what they have. So this one's pigment uh, Y164. And if it has more than one, it'll kind of list them out. All right, so let's go back. So now, hopefully that answers that question. Was there any other questions, by the way? I can answer while I'm painting in the center of the flower. If not, we are good to go. So the center of the flower, um, I don't have yellow, right? The, the flower is yellow in here, but if I use this black mineral, uh, the orange black mineral color with a little bit of white, 
again, I'm always putting a little medium in. I want to make sure my layers stay flexible. Um, I could kind of get a feeling of some kind of yellowish color, maybe transparent orange. Let's try that. We knew that kind of tinted out to a yellower color. I think that did work better. Let's see. Yeah, this one looks more yellow. So I'm going to use, for my yellow, I'm using transparent orange and titanium white. I'm going to paint in a little bit of, just give the impression of it, you know. I'm just dotting it in. Now, there are these really kind of more saturated, more colorful oranges in there. So I'm going to dip my brush in there and put a little bit of those in there. Just a little impression of that. Flower is almost done. I'm gonna add some leaves in. The leaves, um, we don't have this kind of yellowy green, right? So I'm just gonna improvise. I'm gonna use this. Uh, the green we do have is the mineral green deep. So I'm gonna grab some uh, liquid, melt it in there. Let me get some more titanium white. I usually put out too much paint color and then I never put out enough white. You don't have to put out as much paint as I do. This is like enough for like 10 paintings a size probably. Uh, I'm used to painting really big. All right, I'm gonna map out, I already have them mapped out. Let's just start. I'm gonna paint in the whole layer of dark first. And then I'm gonna put like some highlights on it after. So if you want a nice clean edge, just paint alongside of it. You can see we don't have a detail brush, but we're still getting a lot of details in. Um, if you want to grab a detail brush, you're more than welcome. Uh, this, I try to limit the supply as much as possible. I know there's a lot of um, a lot of goodies you can get when you're <laughs> when you're in an art store, and I want to make sure you kind of get set up with just the minimal for this. And if you're really into it, you know, you could always get your smaller and bigger brushes. So there's this blue flower and behind it's this flower. I'm constantly looking back, um, painting from this one right now though. So put the little leaf in, it's all blocked out. Again, it's pretty, you know, transparent layer because I have liquid in it, even though it's supposed to be opaque, it is opaque, but I just put a lot of liquid in there. Uh, I'm gonna go in now with the lights. I'm gonna make sure I put a little liquid in my white. I wanna make sure I have as even amount as possible throughout this whole layer. I'm gonna go in and I notice there's like, it's almost like a shimmer of white. So when I paint it in, I'm going to leave it kind of wet in there. And then I'm gonna pinch off my brush and the paper towel and kind of blend it out the edges. So that's kind of how I typically paint. I apply the paint and then with a different brush, or if I want to use the same brush, I'll pinch out the color. I'm not putting it in the, the, the thinner, the, I mean the solvent, um, because the solvent will kind of make it really, uh, it'll start to kind of um, water down or break down my paint a little, and I don't want to clean my brush completely. Uh, so with the brush that's kind of more dry, I'm going to go ahead and tap in and kind of smooth out the edges. If I had a little of the thinner on there, it'd probably melt the layer I had underneath it a little bit too much. So that's my trick, I'm kind of blending things out a little. So I'm gonna do that on the other uh, leaves real quick. Lighten up some areas. I can do this all day and just paint flowers. <laughs> Now I notice I don't have a lot of darks in them. So I'm gonna add some dark uh, by just using a little more of my green. I noticed there's probably like a shadow under this flower. So I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna leave it kind of thick under there, like a shadow. There's also a shadow in here. Now, if you're, you've been doing art or drawing, you learned that to do shadows, you also wanna add the complementary color. 
So complementary color is the opposite. So if you have green, the opposite of it's gonna be red. And we have a red, so I'm gonna add a little bit of this ruby matter alizarin to my green, and that'll make a good shadow green. In nature, uh, things usually have opposites. So if something is in light, it's dark. If something isn't green, it's red, or it's pushing towards red. Uh, so when something's not in the light and it's green, it's gonna push towards, uh, it's gonna be neutralized or grayed down with its opposite. And that'll give it kind of the illusion of light. Kind of like if you're doing charcoal or graphite drawing, you create the illusion of light by doing lights and darks, lights versus darks, right? And then you have midtones in there too. But with color, it's the same thing. If you want to give the illusion of light, you work with the temperature of the color, the dark, I mean, the green versus the red or the cool versus the warm. All right, I like the way this is looking out. It's looking good. I totally recreated this whole leaf differently. <laughs> so if you notice this leaf, this happens to me all the time. It really goes down all the way here. Do I want it to go down there? Maybe not. Maybe a little more though. Whenever I make a mistake like that, I always just think like, well, it's, it's my individuality coming out. So it's fine. All right, I like this leaf. Anyone have questions with the leaves at all or any of the stuff I covered? If not, we'll go into the background. Looks like we're all good. Cool. All right, I'm gonna go in. Um, now the originally I used a much more gray kind of blue and I did that semi-intentionally because I was like, oh, I, I bet I could show them how to glaze. So I'll show you how to glaze a little later, but this blue, man, we have something really close to that. We have this, um, uh, the oriental blue, right? It's very vibrant. So let's go vibrant here and then I'll show you how to glaze in the other one a little later today. So I'm gonna get my oriental blue. Now I'm gonna just kind of block it out first. So I have some of the liquid and I'm gonna do a really thin layer kind of in the background. Um, let me get a little more liquid. Just plop it in. You could see if you want it really vibrant like this, you should just do it. Me, I'm gonna be a little bit more accurate, but I'm gonna dull down a little, uh, just so you could see kind of how you could use these bright colors um, to be a little more realistic. Now this is uh, reaching towards more of a, uh, I guess it's not too purple, uh, but mine's a little too cool, huh? So I'm gonna, get a little bit of the purple and add it in there too. Now these edges are gonna be a little tricky to do edges again. You could put your brush right up alongside of it uh, instead of kind of pushing in. Now these are uh, the filberts. So filberts don't have that sharp edge, but uh, so if you had like a flat brush or bright, you'd have a sharper edge. But I like filberts because you could blend a little bit easier because it's round. Um, and then I feel like with a small brush, you could kind of get in there more. So that's why I had you guys get the filberts. If you're curious on brushes, I'm gonna block this all in first. It's a little awkward painting with the, the camera above because usually I hold the brush out like way out here, um, but I'll be hitting the camera. I'm gonna make a beautiful little ragged edge in case I don't end up framing this. Go ahead and paint this in. Again, I'm, I'm not being too careful because I know I could always go back and bring out the flower more if I'd want. I should use my small brush in this case, but it's working all right. I'm just gonna scrub in. Another reason why to use medium, you can see here is canvas is a great, uh, texture, it holds a lot of paint well, but sometimes you're fighting against a little, so it's nice having a medium in your paint to kind of thin it out a little so you could kind of have easy flow. And uh, like Windsor Noon and you know, a lot of these big brands are gonna have high pigment uh, in there. So when, even when you tone it or uh, thin it out, you're still gonna get a lot of good coverage. 
Oh, I forgot. I was going to paint the whole background blue. In this case, um, we have this wood grain. So we're going to do that a little later. So I'm going to get this blue in. I'm going to end it about there, making these artistic choices on the end. Uh, there's some wrinkles. Let's do those. So I'm going to get some, maybe this uh, smalt is like a nice dark blue for a shadow. Paint that in. It's not getting as dark as I want. So I'm going to add a little red. A little transparent orange will make it more shadowy feeling. So I'm putting some of that. That's too neutralized, too gray. I think we just discovered a new way to make like a orangey black color. Put some shadows in. Now I want to get rid of this transparency. So I'm just going to put a little bit of white in there. If you add white, it's just going to make your transparent colors more opaque. So it's a really fast, easy way to kind of go about it. And uh, white is always typically going to make your color more dull a little bit sometimes. So in this case, it'll, you know, if you're making, if, if you ever use purple and you started mixing white in there, you're like, why? Because the purple just, you know, it gets killed by the white. The white just really um, tones down the color. It kind of always adds a little coolness to your purple and then it starts to gray down. If you want to avoid that, you could do that by glazing, um, which again, I'll cover later. But in this case, you could see it's dulling down the blue to what I want. Oops, I went over my petal. It's okay. There's me hitting the camera again. All right, so you got to get all this in. I think I'm going to leave it a little bit more um, impressionistic. If you are showing your brush strokes, try to make them look good. <laughs> Make them look intentional if you can. So I'm going to add a few there. Much more vibrant than the last one I did, right? Let's do the uh, browns. So the table, let me just make sure I'm going to cover all this real quick before one. I am going to be on time. All right, so the brown, I have this really dark, um, warm brown pink but I want it more warm because the wood grain is more like orangey, right? Well, we have orange, but that might make it too yellow brown. So I need a little red. And that's pretty close to the wood grain I had. Now I'm gonna add some white because I want it to feel much more opaque. The background, I don't, it, you know, it's gonna be um, this orange, I mean, I'm sorry, blue and the foreground is gonna be warm with this brown pink. Now keeping in mind the way uh, the wood grain went. Last time I, I changed it, I wanted it more horizontal. So feel free to kind of, you know, adjust it as you want. I felt like it'd be more peaceful if it had just horizontal strokes versus strokes that are going diagonal. Let me know if it ever, um, the captions might cover it at all. Sorry about that. It's going to layer in my blue, I mean, my brown. You can see what there's a lot of range, even though we haven't used or we're using just a, a very minimal palette minus yellow, you could still get a lot of range. Um, and I really like when I first got these colors, it's like, oh, this challenge of creating a painting using just these colors when there's no yellow, it's going to be difficult. But I try to look at my color well and I see what composite or like what. Uh, color combo I have. So I have a red orange, but I'm missing a yellow green because I'm missing yellow. And I missing I could make a yellow or a blue violet um, to make a triad of color. But what I have is called a split complementary. So I'm using red orange, which is my transparent orange. I have lots of blues. This this triangle here see this very acute triangle. Um, and there's a green. So I'm using this split complementary uh, color combination. If you want to get into color theory, you should definitely follow us at the Fine Art Collective. I'll, I'll cover that sometime. Uh, but color is one of my favorite things to discuss. Um, and so I think they always have me test out these colors whenever they got, they get them now. I'm going to just layer in the brown real quick. And 
what's great with oil too is this is going to stay wet so i could easily just go back in with the wood grain even like a couple hours later uh, acrylic if i wanted to paint wet into wet i'd have to work really fast to do to do this i'm working on an acrylic project right now and um i'm painting 50 goldfish in 50 days if you follow me you can check the progress out but um it's fun because the acrylic dries so fast. I could literally paint another layer on it like within 10 or 15 minutes if it's dry or warm like it is today. But um, but then sometimes I'm like, it's drying too fast. <laughs> so I have to get slow dry medium in there. But um, but yeah, oil paint is just you know great if you want to just kind of relax more while you're painting, you don't have to rush. Um, there we got a finished painting pretty much, right? If we wanted it to be. But let's add some wood grain. Rinsing out my brush just so that paint's not sitting in there. Ryan. Yeah. Hey, um, real quick, is that the pocket color wheel you have there? Uh, I think it might be. Yeah, the pocket color wheel. Pocket color. Okay, I'm gonna put a link in the chat for everybody in case you're curious about the exact one that Ryan's using. It's like three dollars, and I highly recommend it. It's one of our biggest sellers. Yeah, can you tell I use it a lot? <laughs> <laughs> I can. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so for the wood grain, it kind of has these lighter, more yellow kind of colors in there. Um, I don't have the yellow again, but I'm going to use my transparent orange. I like this challenge of not having the yellow. And then I'm going to add this to my brown. And I'm going to, the wood grains, when I'm looking at it, there's some thin areas and thick ones, and they're kind of all these U shapes, like a sideways U. So I'm just going to paint it in. I'll just give the impression of it. So I'm not literally painting in every one. With an impression, you're just going to suggest kind of where things are. It's a lot of fun when you just use a few little strokes and it starts to look like wood. I'm going to make it a little lighter in the foreground, trying to give the idea like the flowers casting some shadow on it. I'm always curious to see how different the one I do in the demo is. They're always a little looser because I'm not having to, you know, talk in between. Uh, so I feel like I have less time to do it, but. Um, but I'm always curious to see like the colors are much more, um, I have much more uh, darks in this one. So I'm gonna try to lighten it up a little, especially the foreground and more titanium white. So I'm, a lot of times I like the ones I do in my demo more. They're just a little more fresh. I, I My biggest criticism I got from my mentors or when I was in art school is like, loosen up Ryan, because <laughs> I'd like to tightly render everything. Um, but it really helped me paint faster. So even though I do kind of more rendered things, um, they gave me a lot of good exercises to be loose. Uh, there's kind of a sheen that I could do by glazing later if I wanted to, or I could add it in now. It's kind of like a blue sheen. We'll just add some blue and white to our brush. I'm gonna get a little liquid. That was. and just kind of give the impression maybe of like it being even lighter in the front. I think I might just have to glaze that in. All right, let's see where we're at. We got this background in. We're gonna paint in the colorful flowers. These ones are gonna go a little faster because I don't really have to blend as much. Like they're so saturated. We have this blue, this oriental blue, super bright. Um, by the way, this is like, some of the worst <laughs> palette uh, habits uh as my colleagues or friends would say um my palettes are usually a mess and then my paintings are usually a lot tighter like how do you do it um i don't know uh, i think i just like i kind of have this like uh i mean i have adhd so i have this very quick kind of like need everything immediate kind of feel and it it works for me all right so the blue we're just gonna get it in how we see it here. I'm gonna avoid the yellow area if I can. 
actually the yellow area in mine might be completely gone, so I'm not really pointing it. No yellow area in the blue, um, but I'm gonna just pull this paint over my background, try to keep it as saturated as I can. I know you're getting a little glare now, so I'm gonna put, um, my studio lights are so bright. That's why I wear my hat all the time is to block the light on my, or block the studio lights there. Hopefully there's less glare. Rinse out my brush. Let's go for orange. Now, typically you would put it, if I'm using the same brush, I should have done the uh, transparent orange first because it's a lot lighter. Um, sometimes it's hard to get those darker colors. Completely washed out of your brush, um, a quick notice. The orange, I'm going to put in the orange flower here. Oof, I accidentally grabbed some blue. You know when that happens? My favorite part about art making and painting is I like jazz, like jazz music where they, they have to improvise by what they're the other band members are doing. And, and that's what I like about painting. Something happens like that. I'm like, well, see if what we could do to work with it. I'm gonna get some more orange. Just cake it on top. Maybe it feels more like a shadow. I could have removed it easily if I wanted to. I'll show you a good tip I got from a mentor of mine when I visited his studio. I was like, why do you have so many Q-tips everywhere. Like, are you really cleaning your ears that <laughs> much in your studio? But Q-tips are made to pull up oil or wax, right? Uh, I always use the ones that are kind of paper center, so you're not using a ton of plastic. Um, but you could use it to, like, let's say I wanted to, I was like, oh man, I painted over where I wanted that center to be. You could push really hard and start to lift the color out. Uh, and it's great for kind of squeegeeing away the color or lifting it as much as you can out. Uh, so you can even use that as a, a paint tool if you wanted to, to kind of lift things out. Uh, but I have a lot of these around. You know, they come in those packs of like a thousand. So <laughs> I'm gonna put in the center of this flower, no yellow. So I'm gonna use white and a little bit of this orange and just kind of dot it in there. So I'm gonna go over my color, my whole painting a little bit more, just kind of refining it a little bit. Um, there's some things I wanna do still in my flower. I wanna really define some of the edges. So I'm gonna get some more titanium white, put some of that out. And there's still a little color that didn't get washed on my brush. That's so not pure white. I mean, I'm adding a little liquid too. And I'm just going to sharpen this edge that I wanted to be a much, feel like it's just popping out in front of the background a little bit more. And clean it up. So I have this disorder of like brush strokes in the background. And then I have a lot of clarity with the magnolia or the star of the show in this case. Ooh, see how it grabs some blue? I'm going to leave it. I like when things like that happen. For these sketches and stuff, it really kind of energizes it. One of my favorite paintings, I'm going to show you. Going off script real quick. Um, my favorite paintings I did was this painting. <laughs> I just threw together in like, I think it was like 20 minutes. And just all these strange little things happen like, I actually got green in my brush and I was like, you know, just go with it. And I don't know, it creates these really beautiful kind of moments in there. Um, but I always stick out of my studio, even though it's an old painting and kind of a minor piece, like I don't sell the more abstract work. It just inspires me to like, you know, go with things a little bit more if I need to. Um, there's these things that'll happen in your art that for me, at least we're collectors. <laughs> always tend to like the things I like the least about my painting sometimes. Uh, I had a, a professor that told me one time, he's a photorealist, his name's Jack Mendenhall. 
and he does photorealism work. He's up there, one of the first 10 photorealists with like, you know, Chuck Close and Robert Bechtel, Mel Ramos, all those famous artists. And he said, you know, you'll copy the photograph as close as you can, but that 10% that you can't get right is that character that the painting has that helps it sell, like helps collectors kind of be able to enter the painting. And in my own work, I was preparing for a show and there is, um, I'm just cleaning up these edges while I'm talking, by the way. Uh, there is uh, this painting I like hid from my uh, art dealer because it wasn't ready yet. And he's like, where's that, you know, eighth painting? I needed that for the show. I'm like, uh, I didn't want to say it wasn't done yet because, you know, it's still early in my career. And I showed him, he's like, oh, it's wonderful. Let me take it. But I hated the hands. Like the hands were still flippers on the person. The nose wasn't fully rendered. And all I could see are those flaws in the hands and nose. They weren't done piece ends up selling for a good amount of money and I was terrified that the collector they hadn't seen it in person yet and the first thing they said was like Ryan I love it I love the hands and the nose and I was like why why I like I, I didn't understand it but now looking back I'm like you know the nose and hands had more personality than any of the other parts of the painting uh, even though they weren't even complete so sometimes you'll think, um, sometimes like you, some parts of your painting will be an eyesore, but it's always good to get a second opinion because you'd be shocked to see that somebody likes that little stroke of blue or something that happened. All right, so let's get some white in. I'm just adding more highlights. Yeah, I'm really liking the way it's going. I'm gonna add a little, uh, like what they call like a touch line, a shadow that's going underneath the flower. Uh, so I'm gonna rinse out my brush real quick. We did this painting fast. I hope you guys are having fun. And if you haven't painted today, I hope you get to. Uh, I get to work and teach to later today. So I get to do a little bit more painting at, uh, I do teach at a art classes in San Francisco. So I'll be painting all day today. I'm gonna sneak in these darks. Oh, for the darks, I forgot, I'm sorry to mention, I'm using the, the purple I was making is the uh, ultramarine pink and oriental blue. And you get, I'm gonna to try to show you on this a little bit because I've been using this a lot too for shadows. Oops, I need more of this. It's kind of a real dull violet which is not hard to make. It's easy to make a dull violet, but I don't know. I like the gray it creates, but I'm gonna use that kind of as a shadow under here. So I'm gonna go underneath some of the flowers, kind of put in like they're casting a little shadow on the leaf too. Now I didn't put any highlights on these smaller, more colorful flowers. So I'll do that now too, rinse out my brush. The paint's still wet, so I'm just gonna use some liquid and titanium white and just pull, again, giving an impression of like these little uh, petals. They're a little bit lighter, oops, they're a little bit lighter towards the edges, so I'm gonna add some more. I'm gonna pull the highlights out more around the edges. If you wanna paint from life, it's good to kind of set up a light so the lighting doesn't change. Um, that's why I did the first one. Uh, this one, it, you know, if you're still learning like how to paint or draw more and trying to master that, sometimes it's easier to work, or it's a lot easier actually, in many cases to work from the photo because it flattens everything out. Um, I use photo reference all the time in my work. And if you're using anything online, um, just make sure you change it like 33.3%. <laughs> Uh, no, you just want to make sure you change it up a little bit, you know, gives, uh, use it as inspiration. So I'm going to use some of the highlights in the blue. Sometimes I'll use, uh, it, I'll get inspired by images of fish and stuff I use. So I like to always tag the person who used it or ask permission to, they really, enjoy it. If you're going to do a painting of somebody's flower, you could always ask them like, saw this photo on Instagram you did or Pinterest, can I please use it? Um, uh, but if not, make sure you just kind of change it up so it's kind of original. Add some blues in there. Cool. We did it.
All right, I'm gonna go over a few more things um, before we close up. So, uh, oh, by the way, is there any questions? If not, I'll go through. I'm gonna go a little bit. Can we over. ask a question? Uh, oh, there's no me? questions in the chat, but if, if anybody wants okay. to un unmute yourself and. Yeah, can I just ask a question? Because my painting is pretty um, pretty bad and I just want to clean the canvas afterwards. What's the best way to do it? To kind of wipe it all out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not alone. I've done this many times. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So the what I would do is if you have some kind of cotton towel or something or if mm -hmm. you're using one of these, you could wipe it off. Like I could show you um, on here i sometimes will use the medium a little bit you could use mm -hmm. your solvent you just want to make sure you're again in a really well ventilated place because you don't want to be <laughs> kind of breathing that all in um, but you could totally wipe it out and that mm -hmm. can be used as a good ground you know whatever you have underneath and then just kind of paint over it and that is a really good uh point too because with acrylic painting as long as you're painting flat you could always kind of smooth it out and then paint on top when it dries Oil painting, you could do the same thing if you wanted. You could kind of blend it all out with your brush and then paint over that ground you have, or that's what the artist would call it, is like a ground to kind of not paint on the stark white. Next time you'll just paint on a, you know, a more muddy surface. Um, but that's what I do sometimes with leftover paint is I'll, I'll throw it on a canvas. Here's an, see, this was a painting or, or had some leftover paint. And then you kind of just, add a layer so I'm painting on gray now instead of stark white so I'll often do that with all these leftover paints I do for my demos or if I don't like a painting <laughs> but you should you reattempt it I'd like to see and make sure you follow me on Instagram too I'd love to see these photos or uh what was it uh hashtag create with plaza art I believe right that is correct I will put it in the chat uh I am gonna uh show you some glazing techniques. Uh, this is my favorite part. I've been looking forward to this the whole time. <laughs> uh, glazing is, I'm gonna show you some work real quick. So don't mind me, I'm gonna lift you all up. And glazing is when you uh, create layers of paint. So I had a painting underneath this kind of similar to what I do here, right? And then I'll put really transparent layers of paint on top. So you can see, this is why I'm excited that with our eight colors that Windsor Noon has, five of them are transparent. Uh, you could glaze with opaque colors. It's just gonna cover the background a lot more. So transparent orange is actually in here. Um, and also in some of these areas. And I just wanted it to kind of glow more and have some kind of warm, there's a cool highlight. I wanted a warm shadow instead of glazing with an opaque orange, like most of the oranges I have are opaque, transparent orange is transparent. So you could easily kind of glaze it in. This fish I'm painting now is gonna have a lot of glazing on top. Uh, I haven't started yet, but I'm trying to create a really big glow. Uh, so that's kind of what um, I'll be doing. I'll be glazing over this. It's an Asian arowana. Um, and it's gonna have a lot of bright colors. When you add white to a color, it'll again kind of um, it'll make it opaque, but it'll also make it um, less, uh, it'll, it'll kind of uh, kill the saturation a little. With glazing, uh, the color is getting illuminated by what's underneath and shining out. So you get this very beautiful um, saturation. So I'm gonna actually glaze on this one I did earlier. I put you back on your little stand. So we're gonna say bye to this one. I'm gonna actually show you on um, this painting I'm working on. Can you all see this? My froggy painting. Uh, I wanted these uh, leaves to be more orange like this, and but they started off like this, more yellow. Actually down here is the yellow part. And I want more saturation. The white kind of killed the yellows and oranges I had. So I'm gonna get my transparent orange with a little bit of my liquid. and it's transparent, I don't need a lot of liquid, but then I'm gonna, on top, 
let the values that are underneath show through the paint. So I did all that heavy lifting earlier by creating the values a light, a medium, and a dark. And now I'm just kind of glazing in a transparent color. So it'll start to get a nice orange hue. So that in a nutshell is glazing. Now, uh, I'll go over a little bit over fat and lean when we do glazing, but first let me show you um, how to, let me set this down, how to like pump up this color. So it's, let's say I got this gray in. This is thoroughly dried, like it's been drying for weeks. But if you were oil painting, this is why I always have like, you see my studio, I have like five, 10, 12, maybe more paintings going. I need it to dry really thoroughly. If it's not dry completely, it you'll risk the permanence of your painting. Like it, layers could start, you know, sometimes cracking and stuff like that. So we're typically always uh, waiting for the layer to dry completely. If you're using acrylic, it's going to dry in the day. I'd probably wait a whole day before doing a nice layer on top. Uh, oil paint, I'm going to wait a week or more. Um, and I'm using liquid, which is fast drying. So if I was only using linseed oil, I might wait two weeks or more before glazing in. Uh, it's a very slow process, but the results are ones that I just, I just can't ever get rid of. I always want to use them. Uh, so I'm going to get some liquid. I'm going to use some of the oriental blue, that very vibrant blue. And I'm going to start pumping up the color, like just getting it really saturated. All the value midtones are there. When you're glazing, you want to keep in mind that when you glaze, you're not using white typically. So it's going to make the color darker. So if you're going to glaze, if you're planning on glazing, make everything a little bit lighter, lighter like a couple of values lighter, knowing that when you glaze on top, it's going to get a little darker. So I'm just going to kind of scrub in some of this color and you can see it's creating a lot of depth as well but which is another reason why i like um glazing uh contrast is something that could be considered amateurish with painting a lot of times their teachers are always trying to get you to make sure you focus on those mid-tones i'm kind of a little bit of a punk <laughs> where i want that high contrast like caravaggio you know I want it to be really dark and lots of lights. Um, and if you like that too, then glazing, you know, will help you get there really fast. I could even glaze on top of the, the uh, I'm gonna zoom in. I really want you to see um, how this is working out. And it creates this transparent layer that'll push things back or, vib or make the color more vibrant because the light color that's underneath your glaze is really pushing out the color. There. So I'm not going to take all this time to kind of show you all this, but you get an idea of how you could get the color in there. I'm going to. Oh, oh, can oh, I yeah. ask a question? With the flower, you painted the glaze on the entire fat flower or only on the dark part of the flower? Uh, I could do either. Yeah, I could paint over the whole thing if I want to kind of knock, knock it back, or I could paint in just the dark parts. Another technique, remember, I just showed you how to rub out paint with the um, Q tip. You could also do that. You could paint glaze in and you could also remove some too to pull out the lights again. Uh, so that's kind of how I'd glaze in uh, my painting. If you haven't tried glazing, it's a lot of fun. It's a good way to practice is by doing some acrylic first. I'll show you this example I did the other day. If you go to the Fine Art Collective, I did a deep dive on transparent orange, my favorite of these eight colors. Um, I did a black and white painting of uh, an acrylic real fast with um, an orange. And then I waited to dry for a whole day, you know, just to make sure it's fully evaporated. It's kind of humid here sometimes. And then I glazed in the transparent orange and you can see it creates this like luminous effect. Uh, yeah. For um, this orange one, I'm gonna show you real quick and then we'll go over a little bit of brush care and other things if you're new to oil painting. So you can see again, it starts making it more vibrant, more saturated. You can't mix this color that I'm glazing in 
because as soon as you add white to transparent orange, we know what it looks like. It looks like that pastel -y orange. So if you're ever looking at these classical paintings or even some more contemporary paintings and you're like, how did they get a color? And it's really saturated. Sometimes they're layering it in, layering in all this um, glazing uh, the color on top. Was there any questions? It's gonna go over a little bit of brush care and varnishing as well. I know those are questions that come up a lot with oil painting. I'm gonna go. Well, Roberta just asked what paper you were using. So I put in the chat that uh, okay. you're using a canvas pad. So um, awesome. All right. all right, fat over lean. I'm gonna go over fat over lean real quick because it's really important with oil painting. You'll hear it a lot all the time and it usually confuses people. It confuses me for many years. <laughs> a lot of the times you're gonna hear me saying, teachers saying and stuff, do this. You can never do anything otherwise. But you know we're artists. You know we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna break the rules. Is not what we're do. But um, if you want longevity in your painting, uh, you you could do what's recommended by you know the paint brands are using. In this case, Windsor and Newton. Uh, like with uh, they're always uh, about longevity. They're telling you how to use your paint so that it doesn't crack or warp um, and start to get brittle. Uh, fat over lean is basically. Uh, oil is fat, so that's the easiest way to remember it. But a better way sometimes is to remember flexible over um, uh, less flexible. So if I'm using only solvent in my paint to kind of sketch out a layer, a lot of oil painters do that, that's how I was taught. You're going to have a very rigid layer, very rigid. And then as you're adding more fat to it, it's gonna be like more flexible, like it can bend a little more or expand and contract with weather and heat, humidity and all that. Um, but if you're painting rigid over rigid layer over rigid layer and then a flexible layer and then a rigid layer and a flexible layer and a rigid layer, these flexible layers, whatever's on top is gonna to start to get brittle and kind of break. Now I have paintings that I've done a long time now with liquid and liquid's more flexible than uh, linseed oil. And I push the limits to my mediums, meaning I don't follow this rule all the time. So I'm a little bit more at risk with my paintings cracking and I've had paintings crack before. With liquid, I've had a little more success because I think it retains 10% of the, like the water content or something in the alkyd, whereas the, or the moisture content in the alkyd, where linseed oil, when it dries, is only 2%. So it's a little bit less flexible. Uh, Liquid though, if you use just as a top layer to kind of like varnish things out, it's gonna yellow probably. Same thing with like linseed oil. So to protect your paintings, they need to dry for about six months. I know it seems like forever. I rarely varnish paintings because they go in the gallery cell or I get them back and put them in storage and forget about them. But um, uh, you want to protect the surface in case, you know, something splatters on it or dust can kind of get into the paint. Also paint sometimes could get a little matte. So you'd be like, what happened to all these beautiful blacks and darks I had? Uh, and you might have that experience. You could put a really thin layer of um, varnish on and that'll protect it. But again, my, I'm, I'm supposed to highly recommend not varnishing until six months after. I know some people are trying to rush to do it. If you do feel rushed, like I need to varnish it within the next two months or something, uh, they recommend using the retouch varnish um, because uh, it's you could kind of, um, I think it's not gonna seal it as much as like the, the gloss varnish. But any questions with that? I know fat over lean is kind of a hard concept sometimes for people. Um, if you're not too worried about, you know, your painting lasting a hundred or 200 years, or, you know, maybe don't worry about it so much, <laughs> but I've had some crack after 10 years when I was playing around in college and pushing the mediums to their limits. Uh, I was painting a lot of thinned out paint over um, uh, or uh, lean layers on top of the fat layers and then they could kind of crack. I could take more questions, but if not, I definitely wanted to have time to do the, um, the gallery view, was it? <laughs> 
but don't forget to follow me at Ryan Martin Art and please comment and like and follow my journey. I have seven shows coming up, so I want you to see the little group shows if you can. Thank you, Ryan. This was yeah. so fantastic. I know that I learned a ton, so I hope oh, everybody good. 